Then there was another follow-up study uh, in, uh, I think, 80 patients uh, reported by Dr. Arnold Yunus, the chief of lymphoma service in Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, on the immune checkpoint inhibitor nivolumab. That is, as you know, a quite new, very intelligent approach to reactivate T cells in the lymph node where the reed stamberg cells, the malignant Hodgkin cells are located, to reactivate those T cells and attack the malignant cells and kill them through giving an antibody that prevents the contact between the reed stamberg cell and the lymphocyte that paralyzes the lymphocyte. So if you release the break, then the T lymphocyte can kill the Hodgkin cell. And that was in uh, patients that were heavily pretreated with Hodgkin's lymphoma. They had had several relapses, had undergone an autologous transplant with prior high-dose chemotherapy, relapsed, got bentuximab vedotin, the antibody drug conjugate, also relapsed, and then were treated with nivolumab every two weeks. And they had a response rate of about 70%, the overall response rate, with about 10% complete remissions. And with this single drug, I think this is exciting data. And again, here, they should be brought to an earlier phase of the disease and start to combine with another most effective drug like bentuximab vedotin, the antibody drug conjugate. That's what we will start to see in the coming year, how that works out. If you combine that in an intelligent way, maybe we can get to therapy that is free of conventional cytostatic drugs with all the early and late side effects. That's the ultimate goal. Keep the cure rate as high as possible or even enhance it, but reduce the early and late side effects. Another example of an antibody drug conjugate, this time against acute myeloblastic leukemia, was presented by Dr. Amir Fati from Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Uh, in elderly patients, fragile patients with acute myeloblastic leukemia, and he treated those patients with this antibody drug conjugate, the antibody directed against CD33 that's present on AML cells and acute myeloblastic leukemia cells. They internalized the complex, those cancer cells, and split the cytostatic drug that is attached to the antibody that can do its work and kill the cells immediately. So it's a Trojan horse sort of approach. And there he combined it with hypomethylating agents, as, the, as they call it, and got a significant response rate in elderly patients higher than with uh, combination chemotherapy. So also there, there's the perspective of bringing that to an earlier stage of disease and maybe also introduce it for younger patients with AML to get higher remission rates and maybe even higher cure rates. That's another promising new field. Then there was a presentation by Dr. Hasenberg from Amsterdam, uh, Academic Medical Center, Department of Hematology, uh, who focused on B cells after allogeneic transplantation. We know that the curative effect of allo transplants in patients with leukemia, lymphoma, is due to the donor T lymphocytes that are in the graft. But what she found out after transplantation that there are killer antibodies that can be detected in the blood of these patients produced by B cells, not by T cells, but by B cells. And this important clinical finding will now be brought further to employ this antibody, uh, this killer antibodies or killer antibody producing cells to employ those uh, as, 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 as good as possible to fight acute myeloblastic leukemia. I think this is a very intriguing first step on exploring the role of B cells and antibodies against AML in conjunction with allogeneic transplant. We will hear, hear more about that, I'm sure. And then finally, I would like to refer on a non-malignant disease. I'm a malignant hematologist, but this presentation by Dr. Catherine High from Philadelphia Children's Hospital, I think one of the utmost pioneers in the field of gene therapy for hemophilia. Uh, she came up with uh, four patients treated with a new vector, an AAV vector, patient with severe hemophilia B, a lack of factor 9, and she showed a sustained increased level of factor 9 in the blood of these patients. It should be above 12%, while well, this was 30-40%, and sustained over months and months, four patients so far. Those patients didn't have didn't need the preparation anymore, the coagulation preparation, you know, uh, in the, on a weekly or twice or three weekly basis. No bleedings anymore. And this is only a four patient, but I think it's the most promising data I've ever seen. And that's what she confirmed when I asked her. And I asked her, since when are you involved in gene therapy of homophilia? She said, since 1997. So it's now 19 years 
in the lab, back and forth, lab to bedside. And now it seems to take off. So there are many centers opening in the States to participate in this particular trial. And it would be a major step forward for this dreadful disease that invalidates so many young people. Uh, so I think we, that, that series should be extended and we will certainly hear more at our next meetings.